So I just woke up a little while ago. Uh, I've even got the bed head and everything. And I think I kind of have a cold. But um, I was reading about the Foo Fighters drummer who died of an overdose. And I could tell you maybe two Foo Fighters songs, to be honest with you. And I didn't even know who Taylor Hawkins was. But um, but I, I was reading you know some articles about this. And I noticed that in the comments section, and this is very common, whenever someone dies of a drug overdose, uh, people will write things, uh, very frequently will write things like, oh, they had everything, you know, they had money and success and they had a, a career and they had a fun life and they had beautiful kids and a wife and blah, 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 blah. You know, what a waste, what a waste. Why would they throw it all away? And the kind of ignorance in that comment is really perplexing to me because we're all living like the same life. And people, and it's very sort of strange to me when people make comments like, I don't know why someone would do drugs, or I don't know why someone would do something self-destructive. Um, look, I, I, did a, I did a video months ago. It was one of my philosophy videos, which don't get many views because most people um, don't care, I guess, about to think about philosophy or the deeper things of life. Most people are just interested in the celebrity stuff on my channel, which is fine. I mean, that's that's the most popular stuff. That's what gets me the views. So I'm thankful for it. And I'm always happy to defend Marilyn Manson and Johnny Depp and talk about the other, the other celebrity stuff. But I did do a philosophy video uh, months ago. The title of it was, uh, Why is Life So Hard? And I talked about personally, you know, dealing with depression, but I don't want to talk about clinical depression today. I just want to talk about the fact that no matter how great your life is, or, you, or no matter how great your life may appear to be. Life sucks. I'm going to say it. And maybe it's just because I got up this morning, maybe on the wrong side of bed, and maybe because I have a cold and because I kind of got pissed off at the article that I read or the comments. But I get really irritated when people say, oh, life is wonderful. You just got to enjoy it. You just got to enjoy it. No, life is actually very, very difficult, even if you have a very blessed and charmed life. And I want to talk about several things. I talked about some of this in my video on suffering, why is life so hard? And I talked about my depression more in that video, which I don't want to get into here. But look, there is a, <laughs> I think that there, there are a lot of people who are very invested, psychologically invested in defending to themselves the idea that life is not so bad. In fact, I think sometimes I observe almost a kind of a, a kind of a, an attempt by people to talk themselves into believing that that life is great so that they don't have to, I guess, face the truth that it's generally not, even if you do have money and wealth and success and a family. And so I'm not here to like on a Sunday to um, bring everybody down, but I just want to explore <laughs> a few perspectives that will really help us to unpack this sort of, I think, kind of delusional thinking that life is just great. And if someone, if someone does drugs or they commit suicide or whatever, then they were just obviously messed up because how can anybody who, how can anybody have a problem with this? Or how could anybody who's wealthy and who's in a, in a famous band and has, have, and has beautiful kids and a beautiful wife, what problems could they have? Why would they need to take drugs? You know, there is a perspective in philosophy uh, called antinatalism, and I'm not here to promote this. I actually, you know, in the end, I actually do believe that life has a purpose and life has meaning. And I believe in things like faith and I believe in God. I, I believe that when we die, there's something that happens after we die. I believe all of these things. So I'm not coming from a place of just utter like hopelessness, like life sucks and then you die. But life does suck. <laughs> And there's plenty of beautiful moments. There's plenty of uh, wonder. There are, I'm gonna, today, there are gonna be fun things that I get to do, or there are gonna be fulfilling things that I get to do. I don't discount that there are all of those things in life and that ultimately that's where the meaning of life may lie. But life sucks. And there's this perspective uh, called whoever you are, I don't care who you are, life sucks. And there is a perspective called antinatalism in philosophy, and it's called antinatalism. You know, natal, like a, like, like a natal unit, neonatal unit where they take care of babies. And the perspective, and I'm not promoting this, even though I actually don't have children and I'm not going to have them, but the perspective is 
that it is wrong to have children because when you have children, you are bringing them into a world and into a life that on the whole is going to give them more pain and more frustration and more dissatisfaction and more discomfort than it will give them happiness, than it will give them joy, than it will give them pleasure. Now, do I agree with that perspective? I, I would have to think, I would have to sit down and I would have to measure out in a day how much frustration and pain and dissatisfaction and yearning there is versus how much satisfaction and how much fun and how much joy. But the perspective of an antinatalist, uh, and I'm speaking in particular about um, there's a particular uh, there's a particular South African philosopher named David Benatar, who is one of the real proponents of this. And Benatar wrote a, a book called Better Never to Have Been. And it is, it's a quote, uh, it, he's basically, it's a takeoff of a quote of a much more ancient philosopher uh, who said that uh, the, the greatest gift of all is to never have been born. But the perspective of antinatalism is that actually, if we had the guts to really face the truth of life, what we would see is that life is more shitty than good, even for someone like Taylor Hawkins. And let me explain, let me explain, and that we shouldn't, oh, and that, that we should not have children because when we have children, we're really only doing it for selfish reasons. You know, when people have kids, are they having kids, are, for, are, they, are they having children for the sake of those children? Because from the antinatalist perspective, what they're doing when they're having children is they're creating beings to suffer. Let me say that again. When you conceive a child, you are creating a being who's who, who, for the most part, their experience in this world will be one of suffering. And it is very interesting, you know, that, that parents uh, love their children, and I don't doubt that they do, because I know the love that my mom has for me, but parents love their children more than anything, and they say that they would sacrifice everything for their kids. And yet, most people don't actually think about the fact that when they're procreating, they are basically uh, bringing another being into a life of, of discomfort, of dissatisfaction, of pain, of suffering. And, um, and so I want to talk about the, uh, this neonatalist perspective. One of the things that Benatar says in his book is that if you think about uh, what you do during a typical day or how a typical day goes for you, actually, you probably, if you had to sit down and actually face the truth and think about it and tally up your experiences, what you would find is that your days are filled with more discomfort and dissatisfaction and pain and suffering than they are with the good things. Let me, let me tell you why. I just got up this morning, right? Do you know what happens? Think about what happens when you first wake up, right? When you first wake up, what's the thing that most of us feel? Think about it. Think about the, when you first wake up in the morning before you get out of bed, before you even open your eyes. It's probably your bladder. Have any of you played this game before where uh, you're kind of half asleep and, but you've got that feeling in your bladder, right? That feeling of like, oh God, I, I can't really sleep because my bladder is so full, but you're still half asleep. You don't want to get up, right? Because you're, you know, you're tired, you're sleepy, you're in bed, you don't want to get up. And so, uh, so you're like, okay, okay, I'll lay here and I'll just ignore my bladder. But you can't really ignore your bladder, right? Because you're, you're, because it's there, right? <laughs> and it's, it's uncomfortable. So you know, there's, the, there's that game that a lot of us play uh, in the morning where we like try to stay in bed as long as we can, but we really can't now enjoy being in bed because we've got our bladder, but we don't want to get up because oh, we don't want to get up and go to the bathroom, right? And so. Our first, a lot of us, our first experience when we wake up is one of discomfort and annoyance and an inability to be comfortable. Now then, you get up, finally, you go to the bathroom, and then what? Well, then you've got a shower. Um, now, some people really love that morning shower. I understand. I obviously do not. Um, you know, I kind of put the morning shower and I, this may be linked to my depression and I do have to concede everything that you're getting in this video right now is coming through the filter of someone who has struggled with clinical depression. I do know that some people are more happier, are more happier, are happier than others. All right. So yes, this is my own impression, but I'm telling you also about philosophers and what philosophers have said about life. You get up, you have to take a shower. That's for most of us, it's not the most fun thing in the world, right? It's kind of a drag. You've got all these chores that you have to do in the morning, right? Self-maintenance, you know, the showering and teeth brushing and put women, women putting on makeup, fixing your hair, you know, grooming, whatever. You've got to make breakfast because guess what? 
part of your suffering every day is going to be dealing with your stomach, dealing with this balance between hunger and being sated. And if you think about it, and this is one of the things that Benatar asks us to consider in his book, you spend a great deal of your, of your day in discomfort, right? Think about it. Think about, for instance, like you go to, you go to work. You, well, let's just talk about the food thing, right? Throughout the day, you have periods of hunger. You have periods of being tired. And so while you are in those hunger phases and while you are feeling tired, you are in a state of, of suffering. Now, you might not think of it like that. It's not like having cancer and, oh, I've got horrible pain or whatever. But if, if you are in a state of mild discomfort throughout the, the day due to hunger, due to being tired, whatever, you're in a state of suffering. And you might say, well, yeah, but those are mild annoyances. Well, so is Chinese water torture. So is a, a mosquito buzzing around. But those annoyances, they build up to a larger sense, whether perceived or whether unconscious, of dissatisfaction. That is suffering. It may be mild, but it's suffering. And then it's not only that. Most of us, our days, for the most part, unless it's a, maybe a, a fun weekend, our days are filled, for the most part, with tasks that we don't enjoy doing. If you're a parent, like I don't even have kids. If you're a parent, then you just know that for the period of time that you are parenting a child, most of the time you're actually not doing fun stuff. I know you love your kid. I know that you get moments of profound joy out of it. But for the most part, parenting, I think, is a drag. So, you know, it kind of irritates me when people are like, oh, Taylor Hawkins, he had beautiful kids. Well, you know, those kids are often kind of a drag. I'm sorry to say it. And I'm, and I'm not saying people shouldn't have children. I'm not an antinatalist because I think that actually there is a higher point to life that goes beyond pleasure or goes beyond feeling happy or whatever. In fact, suffering may actually be one of the big points of life. And if you don't believe me, just look at any of the major world religions. None of the major religions place any kind of emphasis on what we would term happiness. In fact, you look at every major religion and what it'll tell you is that life is suffering. Buddhist, Christian, whatever. Why was Jesus called a man of sorrows, right? Buddha, you know, was, was a prince who was protected for the first years of his life. And then he finally, you know, went out into the world and discovered that life is aging and life is uh, suffering and life is disease and life is poverty and life is death eventually. You know, just the fact that everything that we're doing is going to be negated at the end by death, that gives us a sense of futility. Do you think that Taylor Hawkins, when he was drumming, you know, he ever asked himself like, okay, but... What is this all for? Or what happens when this ends? What will what will this all mean? What will it mean? What will any of these Foo Fighters songs mean one day when everyone who's heard them is dead and nobody remembers us anymore? I mean, that thought right there can stop you in your fucking tracks, right? And I'm not mad. Well, I guess maybe I am a little irritated uh, because I just don't understand the sort of lack of compassion that I see among some people for suffering or this idea that, well, I don't know what he, what, what could have possibly been wrong with this guy? He had such a good life. Come on, people. I mean, are you a human being? Do you know what it is to be out in the world every day? You know, I mean, first of all, performing, let's just talk about Taylor, Taylor Hawkins for a moment or any of these performers. Performing is generally not fun. Um, it has like moments. I, I understand like when you get into the groove and you're really into a song or whatever, but, you know, I've performed, I, I've been on and off in a, in a, just a local band here, not very good, but a local band here and, you know, getting up and singing and yeah, sometimes it's a rush, but, and sometimes you have those transcendent moments, but a lot of the time it's a drag. And, you know, I've been a professor for most of my life. Um, you, people think that that must be the most awesome job. You just get to get up and you get to share your views of the world and stuff. But it takes a lot of motivation to do that. And it's a drag too. It takes a lot of concentration to perform. And again, this is what I said the other day about Philip Seymour Hoffman, another one who died of a drug overdose. Philip Seymour Hoffman may be the greatest actor of his generation, but he said in an interview that he was miserable almost every second he was acting because it required so much profound concentration. It was a drag. He was miserable most of the time, obviously. So this idea that because someone has a dream career or because someone gets to get up and stay on stage in front of thousands of people or they get to play drums or whatever, that that should, be, that should mean that they're not happy. I don't think you understand that that very act of performing itself is often not enjoyable 
or it has enjoyable aspects, but it's also very tiring and exhausting. Just thinking day after day to have to get up there, and do that and on the road and touring and flying and I mean, it's a drag people. I mean, I've never done, I've never been a rock star, but it seems like it would often be a drag. So, you know, you think about your day and you think about, okay, so, and also you're going to spend, if you have a job, you're going to spend most of the time, you know, most of us have jobs that even if, if they are fun at times or fulfilling, they're a lot of work and they're a lot of stress and they're tiring. I mean, just sitting at a desk, if you have a job where you sit at a desk all day, then you are in a state of discomfort for most of your day. We get used to it. We don't think about it or we, we just think, well, this is the way life is. But just think about the fact that most of us have to sit at a desk like like this, you know, even just that, even just sitting in the same position um, can be a drag. Sorry, I got a message. And so the perspective of the antinatalist is that if we were to look at life and if we were to tally up the amount of pleasure and happiness that we experience versus the amount of pain, frustration, even just not getting things you desire. You know, how many of us have been in love with someone who's not in love with us? I mean, I don't know why I'm about to start crying about that, but I mean, you know, we've all had heartbreak. How many of us have been in love with someone who's not in love with us? Do you know what that feels like? That just rip your guts out feeling of like yearning and thinking oh, at some point this person's going to pay attention to me or at some point this person's going to see that we've got this connection and they don't. I mean, that in and of itself right there, I tell you, my first boyfriend, first love, broke up with me uh, when I was in my uh, early 20s. And I had everything. Like, I had a great life by all appearances. But that one thing, I went through a period of like two years where I was just miserable. And I know a number of you can relate. You know, there's, and, and then, and so I'm just trying to say that it's not just that the suffering of life is not just about the discomfort that we feel on a daily basis and all the chores that we have to do, you know, the, the cooking. I mean, just cooking. I hate cooking. Cooking is a drag. Just the fact that every day we have to multiple times a day come up with stuff to stuff into our bellies, that's a drag. It's all, so much of it is a drag. If you think about what you do in a typical day, I'm just telling you most of what you do is a drag. Most of what you do entails discomfort. Most of what you do entails um, obnoxious tasks, seemingly pointless tasks. Even something as, as fulfilling as having children. It can make you miserable. Go online and look at how many women, and, and maybe men too, right? But, I, but if you go online, you'll find all these websites where women are like, like anonymously admitting, you know, that they're miserable with their kids and they're miserable being a mom and they didn't know it was going to be like this. Or, uh, or even some of them saying, I would have never had kids if I had known. You know, what about that perspective when they say, oh, he had Taylor Hawkins had wonderful kids. Well, I'm sure he did. And I'm sure he loved them, but still a drag people. And, um, and then you know that everything that we're doing in this life is going to be negated by death. Now, I, I, I'm, I know that there's more to that. And I, I talk about that in my videos about spirituality and, and God and, and meaning and all of that. But today, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Today, I'm just here to say, if, if you don't understand why a man like Taylor Hawkins felt the need to do drugs, then I think you're totally out of touch with, with the reality of life. And then you add on to that the fact that there are some of us who really do have I think some chemical problems, some chemical imbalances. And I'm not here to moan, get on here and moan about, oh, you know, woe is me, depression or whatever. But I'm just saying, I, when I look at my life, I have been unhappy probably 90% of the time. I'm not happy right now doing this video. Like I've said before, I do these videos almost as a kind of compulsion. I feel the need to, and sometimes they're fun. And I love it when I get good responses from people. That's probably, honestly, that's probably the, the best part. People saying, this really meant a lot to me. This touched me. Or thank you for standing up for Manson or whatever. You know, but most of the time, it's all, it's mostly just a drag. And if you, ha and if there's someone who already has like a chemical problem, an imbalance, if you call it depression or anxiety or whatever you want to call it, then that, that makes it even more of a drag. That makes them that much more susceptible to chemicals that make them feel better. You know, um, <sighs> So it's, it's just, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand this sort of anger that people feel in this judgmental uh, nature, this judgmental perspective 
when someone dies of a drug overdose or when someone kills themselves. Look, suicide in a lot of ways is a very logical act. I'm sorry, but it is. And I'm not going to kill myself. I don't believe that. I don't believe it's, um, I don't believe it's the ultimately what we're supposed to be doing on this earth. I think that we're here for deeper spiritual reasons. I'm not even entirely sure all the time, but I do feel like there is a reason why we are suffering through what we're suffering through. And I think that, uh, that maybe one day we'll understand. But suicide is a very logical response to the condition of this world. There is so much pain. There is so much suffering. And I've just been talking about mild discomfort so far. What about real pain? What about death? What about cancer? You know, what about, I mean, what about it all? It's just go look at a paper, go look at the news, you know? And then at the end you die and it's all seemingly pointless. Now I don't believe it is, but in a, in a spiritual, higher spiritual sense, I believe it's not pointless, but from the perspective that we have here on earth, it all seems kind of pointless. And so this, this view of like, why would he kill himself? Or why would he, you know, why would someone kill themselves? Or why would someone do drugs? I mean, I, I what? Are we inhabiting the same planet here? <laughs> um, and you know, there's even a view in evolutionary biology that we are meant to be dissatisfied because if we were capable of actually being satisfied, if we were capable of actually having an unadulterated kind of happiness, then we would never do anything. If you think about it, dissatisfaction is the motivator that compels you to do everything you've done in your life, pretty much. Why did you get married? Because you had a space in your heart. You had a dissatisfaction. You had a need. Why did you have children? Well, probably because you got bored being married and had to move on to the... No, I'm kidding. Sort of. Um, no, why did you have children? Well, you had some kind of a, a space or a need or a lack or a feeling. There's, I need more. Why did you change jobs? Why did you get a different career? Why are you working right now? Well, because I need money. Well, why do you need money? Well, I need money to live. Well, why do you need to live? Well, I mean, but I'm just saying. We do everything out of need. We do everything out of lack. Now, there was a philosopher and psychoanalyst uh, named uh, Jacques Lacan, and I've mentioned him before. I talk about him in other videos. But Lacan talked about how there is a lack. He called it the lack. It, well, in French. But there is a lack at the core of human nature. There is a space. There is an emptiness. And that lack is desire itself. And that lack can never be filled. That's why anytime you get something that you want, you get tired of it. You know how it is, you get like a brand new car and like for a while, you know, you're waxing that car and you're cleaning it and you're making sure that everything is great and you're just loving driving it around and you, you know, you're parking several spaces away from other people so nobody will ding your car. But then what ends up happening? You get tired of that car. Six months later, you know, you're parking wherever, you're, you know, you're dropping things in your car, you haven't washed it in two months or whatever because, because that desire, that lack within you has moved on now. Uh, Lacan, uh, Lacan basically described it, well, this is my metaphor, but the way that he described it, you can think of it almost as a, as a receding mirror effect. You know, when you stand in front of a mirror with another mirror and you get that receding mirror effect and you can't see to the end of the mirrors, that is desire. Human, the humans are, and maybe animals too, I don't know, but humans are a, a, a great hole of unquenchable desire. And we find things and we find people and we find activities that that help to plug that or that give us some fulfillment or that or that numb that desire, but it's always still there. So yes, you can be the luckiest person in the world. You can have, by all appearances, the greatest life. You can have wealth. You can have a beautiful family. You can have a beautiful children. You can have a great career. You can be on stage every night in front of thousands banging away and you can still be miserable. And that's actually not, it's not a strange thing. Now, I'm not here to depress everybody. The thing is, this should be kind of liberating because look, once you realize that you're not supposed to be happy, that happiness is a, it's a nice byproduct that you get sometimes and hopefully you get as much of it as you can. I wish that for you. But once you realize that happiness is not the point and that it's not even the norm, then at least you can be free in the sort of a Buddhist sense. You can be free to stop judging yourself for not being happy. And you can be free to stop judging others for doing what they felt they needed to do to get through another shitty day on this earth. 
And I'm not here saying, you know, do drugs. It's great. Do whatever you need to do. Obviously not. Obviously not. And I wish that Taylor Hawkins had gotten help for his problem. But I'm not going to judge the man. And I'm sure as hell not going to be perplexed as to why would someone do that? If, if you're wondering why someone would do that, you're just not a very intelligent person. That's just all I have to say on that. And if you are struggling, you know, today with depression, with suicidal thoughts, with addiction or whatever, I, I really hope that you get help. And I'm not here to try to say at all, life sucks, so just do whatever. Just overdose. Just commit suicide. No, no. No, I do believe in spirituality. And if you want, you should go to my video. I'll try to link to it in the comments in the description. Why is life so hard? Because I actually move on from this position to then talking about some theories about about life and and meaning and, and I'm gonna do more I actually want to uh, want to put out a video pretty soon about different perspectives on the meaning of life because meaning is different than happiness and happiness very hard to achieve in any real way or in any significant long-term way in this life but meaning is different so we'll talk about that later some other time and I look forward to putting that out for you but I just had to say this today um, bedhead and all and uh, yeah, so I've got more stuff I'm going to be putting out, putting out on uh, all the things that I cover, Manson stuff, depth stuff, philosophy, whatever. So I appreciate your support. Uh, drop me a little tip in PayPal or Patreon so uh, I can go uh, I can go pick up my drugs from my drug dealer. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, no, seriously, uh, thank you for watching. I hope I haven't depressed anyone too much. But uh, yeah, I just had to say this stuff. And uh, subscribe to my channel, ring the bell, and uh, I'll see you all later.